Welcome to the Cold Steel Surgical Podcast with your hosts Amir Farouk and Chad Ball. All of us at some point in our career experience physical pain while operating. We were lucky to be joined by Dr. Gita Lal on the show today to talk about the concept of surgical ergonomics. Make sure you check out the YouTube version of this episode for the segment where Dr. Lal actually looks at some actual footage of us operating and makes some recommendations on what we might do differently. This is such an important conversation on how we can take care of ourselves so we can better care for our patients. Dr. Lal, thank you so much for joining us on the Cold Steel podcast. It's an absolute pleasure and an honor to have you on the show as uh, someone who's really a pioneer in this whole concept of surgical ergonomics. Can you tell us a little bit about where you grew up and uh, what your training pathway was? Uh, Sure. Uh, First of all, uh, great to meet both of you. And thank you for having me on the Cold Steel podcast. Um, I actually was born in Mumbai, India, and uh, grew up there till about age 10, and then spent, uh, I guess, from about age 10 to 18 in Kuwait City, of all places. Um, I moved to Canada around that time, so just before I turned 18, to attend school at McMaster University. Uh, and uh, subsequently did all my medical training, including residency um, at the University of Toronto. And so Toronto is home. Oh, that's amazing. It was, you know, one, one of the things that we wanted to talk to you, obviously, about given your expertise and your passion for it is ergonomics. So I, I was wondering if you could start us at the beginning and and tell us how you became so acutely and and you know now long term uh, interested in ergonomics. What what is that story? Uh, sure, um, you know I think uh, I didn't start out being that way. I mean I did uh, in the Toronto uh, program, as you know. You know it's called a galley course. I did take time out from uh, residency training to spend a couple of years in the lab. And I thought my career was going to be in the molecular genetics of uh, cancers. I worked at Steve Gallinger's lab on um, pancreatic uh, genetics, pancreatic cancer genetics. And I actually ran my own lab here at the University of Iowa for over 10 years and looking at molecular markers in thyroid and breast cancer. So this was clearly not an initial career path. But um, as I share uh, on my blogs and when I give my talks as well, uh, approximately six, seven years ago, um, I uh, developed a familiar throbbing in the left side of my jaw and face. And, uh, you know, like most of us, I'd had aches and pains in my lower back and and had had some uh, lower back injuries neck pain throughout my training and then, you know, several years uh, in, as an attending. But this time, this, this jaw pain was very different from what I'd experienced before. I'd been diagnosed with temporomandibular joint uh, dysfunction, myofascial, so nothing wrong with the joint, it's the muscles. Uh, but this time the pain wouldn't go away. Soft foods, NSAIDs, nothing helped. And as the weeks wore on, it actually extended to my head, my shoulder, my neck, um, and all the way down my upper back. Uh, That's when I realized that something was really wrong. And to cut a long story short, uh, what I didn't know or I didn't realize what was happening was that uh, this jaw pain was a direct result of that forward head posture that I'd held for many years in training. You know, we wear loops, we wear headlamps, and we're straining forward. Um, in my situation, basically all the extra muscles, so the muscles of the jaw, the shoulders were trying to stabilize my head at the top of my C-spine. And that was the end result of, of, uh, years of forward head posture. Uh, what I realized also at that time was that this is actually a well-studied phenomenon. The physical therapists are well aware of this and they actually started off by treating not my jaw but my neck my shoulder Um, i had reduced range of motion in all these areas Um, i'm still working as a surgeon so clearly i've gotten much better 
But um, that was kind of what laid that initial foundation. I was sitting there during one particularly intense physical therapy session. And I just kind of said to the physical therapist, I don't know why they don't teach us that we could end up with these injuries um, when we're training. And she said, well, I don't know either because I actually give lectures to dentistry students, uh, but I've never been asked to speak to surgical trainees. And that's what kind of, um, you know, it's that light bulb moment you talk about. And that's what kind of sparked my initial interest in then starting a surgical curriculum uh, or a curriculum for surgical residents, I should say. And then one thing led to another. So that was the start of the story. Uh, it's so fascinating. You know, it's interesting on, on the trauma service, obviously, we are heavily dependent in terms of both acute and long term care of our patients with the variety of therapists. And you really do see the occupational therapist, and the physical therapist paying really strong attention to ergonomics and the sense of recovery as well as when folks get home and mm -hmm. these acute on chronic injuries can be, uh, um, you know, quite challenging for patients and it's fascinating to watch them, them work. I was wondering just, you know, at the outset here, if you could frame your version or the version of the term ergonomics, what, what does that mean to you in a general sense? And, and what does that uh, mean when applied to a surgeon or a surgical trainee? Oh, sure. So, uh, you know, there's the uh, International Ergonomics Association definition. And the way I interpret it is it's, it's really a science, right? And it's the name also given to the profession uh, that uses uh, principles and uh, methodology to design. You're studying the interactions between humans and their environment. And as applied to surgeons, it's um, uh, studying our interactions with uh, our environment, which might be uh, the tools we work with, the uh, operating room itself, the table, the equipment that we work with, and then also, that's in the operating room setting, but also a lot of our work is done uh, in the office setting, uh, whether we do office procedures or we're charting on the EMR. So uh, basically the interaction of uh, uh, us and our bodies with our environment. And the whole point of ergonomics or human factors being another name for it is to um, improve well-being. Yeah, it's, it's funny how little we think about the way that we interact with our uh, environment, even though, you know, as surgeons, we're, we're constantly interested in the latest tools and techniques and things like that. But we, we sometimes forget, like, you know, the basics of the way we're standing and, and you know, all those different facets. And, I, and I'm, I, you know, glad to hear about even beyond that uh, in terms of the, the rest of our, our physical environment and beyond. How big of an issue, Dr. Lal, is the is workplace injuries or MSK injuries in the surgical context? Is this really a real uh, big problem or does this really just affect a subset of people? Sure, that's a great question. Actually, I became interested in looking at that because I'll be honest, at the time that I was having the worst of my symptoms, I felt really alone, right? Uh, we don't talk about this. We don't talk about it in medical school, in residency training. We don't, we've never heard our attendings talk about it or rarely I should say. But if you actually look at the literature and I have to admit it's survey studies, it's not you know, uh, the most uh, rigorous of literature, but that's what we have. Survey studies actually show that um, uh, the incidence of of uh, MSK injuries or symptoms, I should say. And uh, if we look specifically at pain, we're looking at almost 70% of surgeons reporting uh, pain from operating. And if we look at the sites of pain, it's pretty much what we would expect, neck, uh, back and upper extremity. So shoulder uh, uh, and arm. And if you look at prevalence studies, Mm, approximately 87, 88% of surgeons will report pain from operating at least within the last seven days. You know, that's just a snapshot in time. So it is uh, more common than we think. Yeah, that's a huge problem. Like 70 or 80% of surgeons saying that they have pain within the last week. That's a, that's a massive problem. Um, so clearly there's that, you know, this is not a, a small issue and something that really needs some addressing. 
So uh, I'm going to, uh, uh, if it's okay with you, uh, get a little free coaching session here. Um, and, and, and maybe, maybe make that, put the, the, you know, put the rubber to the road and, uh, and get you to critique or look at me in the operating room. So I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully this works. Okay. Um, and show you a video of myself doing a laparoscopic case. Um, can you see that? Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I'm the, I'm, I'm in here in, uh, in the bearded guy here. And I'm looking at the screen. And just for context, this is, uh, I'm doing a incarcerated uh, umbilical hernia with some transverse colon stuck in it. And this is posted with permission, by the way, from the patient. Any, any initial thoughts or comments of, about my ergonomics in this, in this video? Sure. Uh, first off, kudos for <clears throat> having someone uh, record you uh, doing uh, what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I often encourage everyone to have someone take pictures um, and just a short, you know, one or two minute video just to get a sense of, um, you know, what our work environment is like. So, you know, right off the bat, some of the things that um, we look for when you're uh, looking at a video is, you know, are there uh, some best practices? So there are best practices uh, for open surgery, laparoscopic surgery, as well as robotic surgery. And I'll just mention a couple of resources here uh, so people can look at the Society of Surgical Ergonomics website. The American College of Surgeons came out with some um, ergonomic recommendations in the fall of 2022, their ergonomics task force. Um, so just some basic things. So I noticed that you're standing on the floor rather than on anti-fatigue uh, mats. So that's something that, as you know, if you went to any other workplace, say if you went to a factory uh, workplace, um, that would be routine, right? So anti-slip as well as uh, providing some cushioning from the concrete uh, floors. Uh, that's an easy intervention and, and uh, they've been shown uh, to reduce uh, fatigue and sort of foot back, lower back and, and back of leg discomfort. So that's an easy sort of intervention um, to do. The second thing, you know, just in general terms, any sort of surgery, uh, looking at table height. So for open surgery, we say it should be at elbow height and table height should be geared to the tallest person in the room. So if it happens to be that you're assisting a resident or a trainee through a procedure, really the height should be at that uh, 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 person's elbow length. For laparoscopic surgery in general, because when you put in your instruments, you have six to eight extra inches at the end of your fingers, the table height needs to be lower. So it's good to see that you're operating uh, uh, with your elbows still about at 90 degrees or just slightly uh, more than that. Um, and you're not doing this uh, as, it, what, as, as would happen. So I assume you've got your table you know, really low. So that's fantastic. Uh, another thing to think about is table, uh, or I should say monitor height. So it's great that the monitor, the tower is right in front of you. I can't tell you, sometimes I've coached surgeons and it's amazing to see that they're kind of looking at a monitor down by the side. So this is perfect. The monitor should be in front of you about three feet away, anywhere from 90 to 120 centimeters. So it looks like this is just at a really good distance. Um, the one slight adjustment I might uh, suggest is if you look at your face, you're kind of looking up a little bit. I call that the sniffing uh, position, right, for surgeons, not the sniffing position for anesthesiologists. But what you want is um, uh, the top of the monitor to be at eye level. So you have a slightly like a 50, 10 to 15 degree downward gaze. I mean, if you think about it, when we're reading or, you know, um, looking at the screen, we tend to look a little bit uh, you know, lower. And that keeps us from doing this, which then worsens, uh, uh, you know, neck uh, symptoms. Um, I can't tell how you put in the ports, but oftentimes the discussion I have with people during laparoscopic surgery is that if you've put your ports in at an angle, you'll be looking, you know, you'll be looking for further 
or, or you'll end up in awkward angles once you're trying to get to your sort of target area in the abdomen. And so making sure that the ports are put in uh, perpendicular uh, so that you have more degrees of freedom with your uh, ports rather than having them restricted if they were skiving. So that's just an initial view. Thank you for this opportunity. It's, I love looking at videos of myself and others operating. So I, I am kind of sad because, uh, I mean, one of the things that I, I became acutely aware because I, I knew we were doing this video or this discussion and I asked the medical student to start recording and I became acutely aware, like at this moment, uh, you know, yep. you can see that all of a sudden I start uh, bending and uh, sometimes you kind of, especially laparoscopically, you have to kind of hold from awkward angles because you're limited by the way that the ports are set up. Exactly. Any, do you have any suggestions for that other than to maybe have better port placement? So, um, you know, Amir, you just pointed out the biggest thing um, that kind of leads to uh, injuries in surgeons. When we're operating right, right there, when you watch the video, that kind of made you aware or maybe during the surgery, as you said, because you knew the purpose you were recording the video for. But in the moment, right, we're just trying to do the best we need to do to take care of the patient. We don't think about our discomfort. We push through it. We accept that these awkward positions are part of our job, right? So um, the first step is taking the video and being aware. And perhaps when it's time to do that particular move, we stop and we say, you know, can we raise the table? Can we make this a little bit less awkward? It seemed like you were having to, uh, you know, uh, bend down to kind of get the angle you wanted. Um, would it be a little bit easier if you, you know, raise the table? Um, and of course, um, if you need it, maybe put in another port. I don't know how easy or difficult that is for the surgery that you were doing, but just the awareness and and thinking, you know, where where things could be adjusted. We're not used to doing that, right? Um, there is something else too. I mean, sometimes I tell people, I mean, I, I'm operating in the neck, right? So. Um, Sometimes awkward positions are necessary. The key thing is to recognize uh, and to keep it short. Um, if it's uh, taking too long, maybe pause and take a break, which I assume you'll ask me about later and we'll talk about that more later. It's, it's so interesting watching you critique and discuss um, you know, Amir's video. It, it reminds me or it takes me to a Tua Gawande's article where he brought in yes, you know, yes. that recently retired uh, surgeon and for those listeners who you know maybe haven't read that article it's it's sort of a, a must read you, you got to go find it and essentially the the long and short of it as as you both know is is the senior surgeon sat in the corner and essentially just recorded all of his you know essentially they were looking at efficiencies not so much ergonomics but you know it, it would be amazing to have you walk into all of our operating rooms and, and assess us as general surgeons as thoracic surgeons as orthopedic surgeons um you know it's obviously such a broad issue it applies to all of us it's uh, a little bit about you know very much like sustainable um surgical operating rooms it it it's it should be all of our business so I, i'm curious if you could just broadly stroke on maybe some of the um, you know, relatively physical, intense specialties within surgery. H how does your thinking change or how is it sort of specialized for, say, orthopedic surgeons or comparing laparoscopic versus open general surgical procedures, for example? Sure. Uh, all great points, uh, Dr. Ball. Uh, so, um, so uh, I agree with you, Dr. Ball, that article from... Uh, Dr. Gawande, and I'm going to put a plug in here because he is an endocrine surgeon as well. Um, that article was inspiring. And we, you know, we don't think of ourselves as elite athletes, but we are, right? We, we have to be at the top of our game to take care of our patients and continue to take care of our uh, colleagues and families as well. And so athletes have a whole team of people Um and, and uh, we don't think about it that way. Wouldn't it be fantastic if, if uh, we had 
a massage therapist, a physical therapist, an ergonomist or an occupational uh, therapist as part of every surgical department where they could along with uh, surgeons. So uh, a surgeon and an ergonomist or a surgeon and physical therapist together, as you said, critiquing or not even critiquing, but just looking, providing feedback, providing suggestions because the, the surgeons actually know what is working for them and what isn't. They just haven't had a chance to uh, really stop and think about uh, these things. And the videos help us do that. Um, when I'm giving lectures, uh, Dr. Ball, I actually say, you know, I wish I could tell trainees, you know, if you pick this specialty or this subspecialty, you're less likely to have um, ergonomics related or work related musculoskeletal injury. But the bottom line is that it, it, uh, it affects surgeons in every specialty. Um, as to how I uh, or others who are interested in ergonomics approach it, I think it's uh, twofold. One is the general principles. Um, and these are the things that we would look at um, uh, or talk about whether we're doing an ergonomics curriculum or a coaching session is you know, the setup, uh, how are we setting up our uh, equipment, what our uh, adjuncts are, uh, how are we setting up for the cases, do we have postural uh, awareness, uh, are we following best principles, and then uh, including some of the best practices from industrial engineering, like uh, breaks and uh, uh, stretches during the procedures, and then also paying attention to the work that we do outside the OR. So how many, how many of us are sitting in common workplaces in the clinic, right, with monitors, uh, typing up notes, things that in, in spaces that haven't been set up for us. So paying attention to both things inside and outside the OR. Uh, in terms of specifics, well, it's, you know, just like you said, if you were looking at let's say you were watching after the fact, an athlete is watching their game video to see how they could improve their performance, just sitting down and, and watching it from a postural uh, awareness side would provide some specific uh, insights. Um, I start off in general terms, but if there's, a, if there's a more experienced surgeon in that particular field, I guarantee you that they've already thought of workarounds for example, uh, at a basic level, for example, uh, left-handed surgeons, right? Uh, I usually ask them, um, our residents who are left-handed, I'm like, you need to talk to so-and-so. Uh, they are also left-handed. They've learned how to adapt to these uh, instruments. Uh, you should get some pointers from them. And that actually then brings up a bigger issue. Um, I guess it's more applicable to orthopedic surgeons, but applicable to all of us. Our instrumentation, our work environment was designed for fitting uh, the average surgeon, whatever the average surgeon used to be 30, 40, 50 years ago. Surgery has, as a field, has uh, diversified its uh, workforce, but our instrument design hasn't caught up. It doesn't have to do just with sort of hand size or hand span. In general, instrumentation is designed with, uh, let's say, at least in the US, FDA requirements in mind. You know, can a particular thing be sterilized, for example? It doesn't, the design doesn't start with um, uh, considering the ergonomics of the end user in mind. But as we provide more feedback, as we uh, bring instrument design companies into the foray, um, I think that will end up improving that aspect of our work environment. And then the third piece is um, organizational culture. If we think about it, our organizations don't really um, think about us in terms of um, our physical well-being and ergonomics and how that affects our day-to-day -day lives. So just increasing awareness in those areas as well. I hope uh, that answered your question. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. I, I hope it's okay if if you let us walk you into those specific weeds here a little bit. And you sure. know, one of the things that great, one of the things that Amir and I uh, wear a lot of 
I think it probably drove Amir nuts when I was always wearing it uh, um, when we worked together. But yeah, is it exactly a, a, a headlight? And I, you know, I, I think we all recognize there's <clears throat> such a wide variety of what's sold and what defines a headlight. Is it a, um, you know, the headlight with the cord that goes out to um, a light source that's on a, a trolley? Is it uh, hooked into a battery in your back? Is it hooked into a very small uh, lithium battery uh, on your glasses? What, what is your um, uh, sort of uh, landscape for, for headlight ergonomics? Sure. Uh, as someone who wore, a, <clears throat> you know, headlight uh, as well for many, many years, I, I understand what you're talking about uh, very well. So there's really good uh, objective data to show that um, wearing headlights actually uh, increases the time that surgeons spend in high risk uh, in an ergonomics evaluation, high-risk neck postures, right? So whatever we can do to improve that will help. So there are general and specific things. Right off the bat, I'll say I don't have any financial uh, interest in any of uh, the companies, but the things I would suggest looking for in headlamps is one is weight, right? So uh, having trying on different types, um, looking for a lightweight headlamp and look at what works for you and the work that you're doing. So for example, you mentioned the small, you know, headlights that come attached to our glasses or loops, and they're great if the work that you're doing is not so deep in the body and uh, they're very lightweight and they work very well for that. But it doesn't work well if you're trying to look deep into the pelvis in an open case, that small light is not going to help. And so you do need um, uh, the stronger uh, headlights, uh, but there you're choosing the most lightweight. Uh, I personally find, and many surgeons find that the cordless ones are better because you're not tethered. Uh, but again, uh, individuals are different. So trying a few different things and uh, finding what works for you and for most of your uh, colleagues is key. Um, the other thing is I don't... Um, I don't, I, I thought about this as I was thinking about my own ergonomics. Uh, when we think about another adjunct like loops, for example, I, as colorectal surgeons, you probably don't, you know, wear loops, but I do, uh, so, or used to. Uh, think about, again, lightweight, as well as um, uh, what we call the angle of declination. So for, for those of us using loops, the angle of declination is the angle at which the magnifying part fits into the glasses. Uh, and the steeper that angle is, the less you'll have to bend your neck forward because a critical thing for us is that forward head posture. Uh, and you don't wanna be bending your neck any more than 15 to 20 degrees, at least for sustained periods of time. And uh, just an adjustment of the loops, getting a steeper angle of declination, or uh, some of them are nearly 90 degrees. So it's like working through a microscope and getting the really lightweight ones makes a difference. But in terms of actual practice, if we think about it with loops and headlights, why wear them for the entire case? I remember, I, I remember wearing them, watching people open, close, when I really just need it for the recurrent nerve dissection or the parathyroid dissection. And then I remembered that my mentors in hepatobiliary surgery in Toronto, they would only put on their loops when it was time for the pancreatic duct anastomosis, and then they would take them off and continue with the rest of the case. So just wearing things for the shortest duration of time uh, is another helpful uh, strategy. You know, you were mentioning about about mats, and you were talking about that when you were critiquing my video. Um, how how useful really are mats? And you know, I'll, I'll just say for context, you know, I have heard many surgeons say, uh, "Can you get me the sissy mat?" Just to you know, like to frame it with that kind of term, as if it's almost like a a sign of weakness. But uh, but tell me about uh, your thoughts on mats. Do those help? And and how how, how should we use them? Sure. So, um, you know, that's interesting. That's, uh, I've heard them being called princess mats, but sissy mat is a new one. I'll have to put that in one of my talks. Thank you, Amir. Um, so sissy mats or princess mats, that right there, before I delve into the specifics of the mats, is um, right there is kind of one of the issues that we have with surgical culture, right? Why does it have to be uh, stigmatizing, or why should we use stigmatizing language uh, like that? In fact, it might uh, deter some people for, for using them, whereas it should be standard 
operating equipment in every in every operating room. So both in the Society of Surgical Ergonomics and in my own business, I partner with ergonomists, right? And the first things they say is, are, why don't you have these uh, cushion mats or anti-fatigue mats as they're called? Uh, because you do need cushioning from the concrete floor. Um, and they're cheap, they're used, um, uh, they're OSHA mandated in some areas in the hospital, but not in the operating room. And the main concern there was infection control. But now you get them in all sorts of varieties that can be autoclaved, easily cleaned, etc. And uh, I think we are affected or biased by a particular study that came out a few years ago, uh, 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 just a small uh, sample size of surgeons, and uh, they didn't feel like it made a difference, or some felt that it worsened their pain. And then the few uh, people that were using mats, then they suddenly sort of fell out of favor. But it's one of those things that's recommended all across industrial engineering, and it's an uh, easy intervention uh, and it's also important for another reason. It's, it's part of being that surgical team. It's not just for surgeons. It's, um, our scrubs love standing on them as well and, and now ask for them. Uh, so um, I feel like they should be uniform in, in, in our workspace and not have that negative connotation attached to them. And anytime someone mentions, mentions the princess mats, I actually say, oh, you mean for the queen. I'm the queen in this OR, so let's get the queen mats, please. Thank you. Oh, fantastic. That's a great line. Um, you know, you had mentioned uh, about this a little bit, and I, and I, sorry, I want to make a plug as well for your blog, because you have some really lovely uh, blog posts that go through a lot of the issues that we're talking about today. So I'll, I'll put those links in the show notes as well, uh, so that folks can find them, because they're really good, and they go through all the, the papers that you're talking about, the evidence around them. Um, you know, one of the things that you've talked about that I found really fascinating, and I've heard this from a number of people now, is this concept of micro breaks or stretching breaks during the OR. I mean, I have never seen anyone do that. Even the thought of someone like taking a few minutes or a few seconds during case to do that is almost like the antithesis of the thought of like the efficient surgeon that's like trying to do as many cases during the day and getting things done and going moving quickly and fit efficiently and um, and uh, smoothly through their day. Uh, so I'm curious, how, what's the evidence around the, taking these breaks uh, during cases? Is it Should we be taking them for all cases? Is there a certain length of cases where we should be doing them? And what does a micro break really look like and what do you do with them? Sure. Um, as you said, you know, I, I think uh, uh, mentioning breaks, micro breaks and stretches are like, uh, it's almost blasphemy in a surgeon or, or a surgical uh, career and culture. And uh, the thing is though, if we look at industrial engineering and ergonomics principles, taking breaks is one of the most effective interventions uh, when it comes to uh, reducing workplace injury and improved ergonomics. And once I started learning about the evidence behind this, I was baffled, right? If you're like me, whenever the scrubs are uh, changing over to take a break or the anesthesiology team is changing to take a break, all you do is sort of sigh and go, oh, not again, you know, here we go. It in interrupts the flow of the case. But I think we they've learned something that we haven't. And that is that we really do need to think about incorporating breaks. So that is uh, that part of it is about a postural reset, not just for our body, but also for our mind. So there are studies looking at uh, breaks anywhere from 20 to 30 seconds, uh, pausing uh, and then uh, you know restarting the case. But what really makes a difference is uh, taking a break, but also uh, stretching to give the muscles that have been strained a chance to reset. And in um, the industrial engineering literature, or uh, if you look at the work of Dr. Susan Hallbeck, she's actually the president elect of the Society of Surgical Ergonomics and the head of the human factors engineering lab at, at Mayo Clinic. She spent the majority of her career actually looking at surgical ergonomics. Um, they recommend that you need a break um, uh, along with a stretch, uh, you know, anywhere from 
So 35 to 45 minutes, at least every 45 minutes. So if you're operating on cases longer than two hours, probably a good idea to do that. Um, and the break, actually, they've worked out a time for the stretches, meaning at least you want to give it at least 60 to 90 seconds. So the 20, 30 second micro break is not as effective as resetting the muscles as that slightly longer break. And you can uh, operationalize this concept in many ways. You could um, uh, use your uh, iPhone or set an alarm or something to go off, just remind you to take that uh, break. Uh, on the other hand, there are natural pauses in cases, right? If I'm doing a total thyroidectomy and a neck dissection, there's a right lobe, I could take a pause there. There's a left lobe, I could take a pause there and then do the neck dissection. So there's natural times. Sometimes it's when you're waiting for pathology, lab work, et cetera. Sometimes it's, as I mentioned, uh, parts of the procedure. Um, so the key thing is that you wanna, wanna take that break and it needs to be enough so that you can uh, reset the muscles that you have had uh, the strain in. Uh, the Mayo Clinic Human Factors Lab and Susan Holbeck's work, she's actually studied this and it was a multi-center trial. Uh, what it shows was that uh, uh, surgeons doing this uh, found that their physical um, uh, uh, symptoms were better, but uh, they also improved their mental concentration, right? And it didn't change. You think taking breaks, oh my God, it's going to interrupt my focus, but it doesn't. In fact, it improves it. And it's not surprising to ergonomists because we know that if we look at workload for surgeons, mental demand is huge, not just the physical demand, but mental demand as well. And there's a whole other field studying cognitive ergonomics, not just our physical ergonomics. But coming back to the physical ergonomics, that, that, that uh, focus uh, actually remains and in fact gets better. And if they looked at the operating room time, it actually did not increase operating room, overall operating room time, just the surgeon taking that 90 second uh, break, because I think it improves the efficiency after that break, you keep moving along. When I first looked at the data, I was skeptical uh, until I tried it because I had to take breaks. Uh, my symptoms were just not allowing me to continue. And uh, uh, I realized that I actually moved faster through the second and third parts of the case. And so I was sold and sat. So now we talk about uh, implementing breaks and how you can do that. You can find uh, a toolkit on the Society of Surgical Ergonomics if you are interested in implementing uh, the OR stretch app that Dr. Uh, Holbeck um, uh, and her team developed in your own operating room. So you can look at that too. Oh, that sounds fantastic. We'll, we'll have to look it up for sure. You know, personally, the background I came from as I sort of entered medicine was elite collegiate and professional sports. And, you know, I was physically built very, very differently than, um, than I was, say, when I started my job as a faculty surgeon. And that change in physicality was intentional. Um, there was a change in distribution of weight. There was change in just, just a, a lot of physical characteristics that I think probably weren't noticed as I went through that process, but, but they were, I was something, you know, it was something that was very cognizant to me that the physicality of what I walked into would not allow me to do long, delicate procedures full stop. So I'm, I'm quite sensitive. And I think, you know, Amir and I are both sensitive to the idea that your, your, your physical fitness or your physical structure is really relevant in a physical job like the operating room. Again, realizing that maybe doing a liver resection in a very thick, you know, 60 year old male is very different from doing a liver resection in, in a mirror. Um, so that's a long winded way of asking what is, what is your sense or do you have any recommendations in terms of exercise, core strengthening, um, neck strengthening, sort of the prevention of uh, MSK fatigue and pain and impingements and, and all these injuries that, that surgeons do suffer in terms of being outside of the operating room? Do you, ha do you have any advice other than, sure, be physically fit and strong? That's a very 30,000 foot comment. What, what, what does that sort of side of things mean, mean for you? Uh, sure, Dr. Ball, you know, that's a, a, a very relevant uh, question. And uh, I had to think about acutely as someone uh, who grew up in a very traditional uh, 
uh, Indian household uh, where academics were uh, it. And uh, I remember uh, being in about sixth or seventh grade and, and coming home with my report card, you know, and my uh, sheepishly showing it to my dad with a C in, or, or C minus in physical education. My dad said, well, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. It's fine as long as you have it. A's everywhere else. I wish I had paid more attention to my physical well-being as I progressed through surgical uh, training and my physical fitness, as you as you said, I wish I had paid more attention to it. But we as surgeons know that the human body has a remarkable ability to heal, uh, given all the trauma we inflict on it in our uh, uh, journeys to take uh, care of our patients and their and their illnesses and and help them heal. So, given it's never too late, is what I'm trying to say, and. Uh, as you said, you know, our, our bodies are our biggest tool here and uh, we need to take care of them by being physically fit. And I say, uh, as we dive deeper, deeper from that 30,000 foot view, cardiovascular fitness is important and great. A lot of running though will not help you as much in the operating room, you really do need to build core strength. And whether you do that by um, lifting weights, whether you do that by working out with a trainer, uh, core strength and um, uh, building certain muscles that are uh, subject to the strains in the jobs that we do. Uh, what do I mean by that? So if we look at specifics, Physical therapists and uh, occupational therapists will describe something called upper cross syndrome and lower cross syndrome. And what the upper cross syndrome means is that if you think about it as we're doing our forward head posture, and it's the same whether we are operating or whether we're working on a computer, the muscles in the front get very tight, our pecs get tight, right? And the muscles in the back are weak. So any sort of um, uh, fitness program that you're doing needs to incorporate exercises and maneuvers that will uh, uh, stretch the muscles that are uh, uh, tight and strengthen the posterior chain uh, muscles. Whether, as I said, you can do that by working out with a trainer, by incorporating Pilates, by incorporating yoga, some sort of stretching and strengthening program in addition to cardio. So I guess that is more of the 500 foot view than the 30,000 view. We can get further into the nitty gritty, but uh, you hit the nail on the head. You know, we, we, our body is our biggest tool here and we, we need to take care of it. You know, one of the things that we've really been talking about indirectly, the whole conversation has been about surgical culture. And uh, you have a really, again, a great blog post talking about ergonomics and, and surgical culture and how those two things intertwine. What have you learned about surgical culture through your journey to try to understand ergonomics? And where do we go to try to improve our culture to take better care of ourselves so that we can take better care of our patients? You're right, Amir, that has been kind of the undercurrent of the entire conversation. Um, and I'll take it back to when I said, you know, feeling uh, alone when I was going through the worst of the pain, wondering, you know, uh, were they right? You know, I, I'd always had a sense of imposter syndrome uh, because I was not a typical surgeon, as I was reminded many times during my training. Um and, and it really made me think, were they right? You know, I really can't hack it. I don't see anybody else complaining about this pain. But as I shared my symptoms and then um, looked in the literature, as I said, you know, we realized that actually all of us have these symptoms to some degree. And, and there is a genetic, you know, and a physical fitness component to it. So some of us are more prone to sort of herniating discs and having sort of extremes of injury. But we all have these symptoms. And so just sharing and increasing awareness that this is not uncommon is important. It takes the stigma away. Uh, and then um, uh, being open to apply the principles that were developed. Uh, you know, ergonomics is new in surgery. We're behind the eight ball, but all these things have been implemented in industry. There's been a lot of research done there. We can apply those principles here. And then also work to... Uh, 
I've come, I've come up against the cultural sort of barriers in surgery, even as we try to implement those best practices from uh, industrial engineering. You know, it takes a lot of convincing for people to uh, want to do breaks or uh, want to take breaks and do the stretches. Like, really? You know, how do you do that? Why, why would you do that? But there are always early adopters, right? Like with any implementation science, there'll be a core group of people that, that take this on and then there'll be early adopters. And uh, I have a feeling that at least as we progress through the next generation of trainees, they won't think twice about taking an ergonomic timeout after the pre-incision timeout saying, do we have the equipment? Do we have the step stools? Do we have everything we need? Uh, in order to be comfortable, you know, they will they will talk about when they will take breaks during the case. This will become a part of surgical uh, training and practice um, rather than an anomaly. I love <clears throat> I love that view of the feature. That's that's fantastic. Now you you created the Society for Surgical Economics. Can you tell us what that is? What the society does and what the impetus was? Be beyond the obvious, you know. Uh, sure. So first of all, I can't take complete credit for it. Um, the Society of Surgical Ergonomics actually started out as an interest group. A uh, few of us surgeons um, uh, sort of got together on Twitter. And uh, I, I think I remember dropping a message saying, if, you, if you're interested in surgical ergonomics, I'd like to start an interest group. So we started meeting uh, over Zoom. It was the early days of the pandemic. And uh, we actually pulled in some people that are normally not part of typical surgical societies, meaning uh, people like Dr. Hallbeck, Dr. Tara Cohen, human factors experts from our own institutions that had some interest in this. And, uh, you know, quickly realized that rather than just sitting around and talking about our own injuries and how they've affected how we practice and, and um, uh, how, you know, how they affect our career longevity, we decided to do something about it. So we brought together all the relevant stakeholders. So, so, so the Society of Surgical Ergonomics is not open only to surgeons and surgical trainees. It's open to human factors experts, physical therapists, nursing staff, nursing administrators, anesthesiologists, anyone in the perioperative space who has an interest in surgical ergonomics. And our goal is to increase awareness uh, provide uh, educational resources, uh, curricula, as well as videos, etc., to be able to in increase awareness and teaching around surgical ergonomics. Um, but more important, well, not I shouldn't say more importantly, but just as importantly, change the culture and the environment. So one of the things, as I said, we, we haven't really addressed um, the instrumentation piece a whole lot in this podcast and it's really hard to do in some of the talks I give as well but getting the industry to uh, industry uh, design folks uh, to have interest in this and uh, really listen to what the surgeons are saying in terms of uh, feedback and instrument design and have it be more of a collaborative uh, 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 process uh, because as we said earlier, definition of ergonomics is our interaction with our environment and, and just saying to the surgeons, well, this is what you can do to protect your injury without actually addressing the environmental piece is a bit like blaming the victim uh, only. Uh, so working towards more systemic change uh, is a huge mission of the society. That's really an admirable goal. And, and thank you for doing this. It's, you know, I, I saw this on Twitter as well. And I see the posts and, and tweets that are coming out, uh, out of that Twitter handle. Um, so that's, and the website is fantastic. That's where I found a lot of those blog posts. So thank you for doing that and being part of that change. I think it's going to make a huge difference. And I really like what you're saying about the equipment stuff. And obviously it's, it's difficult in the time frame that we have to get into all the nitty gritty. But like, you know, an example that comes to your mind immediately is like, you know, we use that circular stapler for our colorectal anastomosis. And yes, like the powered one probably is more expensive it probably doesn't change outcomes but you know when you don't have to do that huge crunch especially if your hands aren't that big um you know I, and i've certainly seen some of my colleagues that have smaller hands where they, they they physically have a lot of difficulty squeezing that handle and then having that you know power stapler where you can just flick it and turn it on i do think there's some value in that and i think that that piece obviously is is missing from so much of the so many of the studies too. You know, um, 
Uh, and uh, for example, like the whole robotics versus laparoscopy debate in, in rectal cancer, I think one key thing that, that people don't even talk about is the very different ergonomic pressures that laparoscopy places on your body versus robotic surgery. And perhaps that's like something so major that we don't even really appreciate it uh, the way we should. So this is all to say uh, that I just think that there's so much work that needs to be done. And, and I think you, your, you folks are doing some amazing work. Uh, thank you, uh, Amir, for those kind words and comments. But you brought up actually something uh, which we haven't touched on right now is that the whole selling point of the robot, right, uh, or robotics uh, surgery in general is the improved ergonomics. And there is definitely an advantage uh, to it because it was designed uh, for us to be able to sit right? And uh, sit at optimal height. It's not step is only four inches wide. And so you've got to go four, eight, uh, 12. You can adjust the console and uh, adjustable chairs to whatever level you like. Laparoscopy agreed 100%. Laparoscopic endoscopic uh, surgery in any specialty actually has the highest rates of work-related injury. And um, uh, Robotics certainly helps, as we said, by by allowing the surgeon to sit down, but there's still some element of uh, paying attention to posture at the robot, because you can certainly have bad posture at the robot that can increase uh, neck and back injuries. What we do see with a lot of laparoscopic surgeons, as, as well as robotic surgeons, though, is that um, there is an increased rate of injury to the hands, right, as you mentioned uh, just by virtue of how uh, we hold instruments or uh, use the clutching at the robot. So having best practices for those, mm -hmm. which you can find in the resources we've talked about, um, uh, you know, is also something to pay attention to. Robotics is an improvement, but it's not a panacea as far as ergonomics is concerned. Right. Uh, yeah. And I, I just started using the we, the robotic console when I came here to Kingston and uh, I certainly remember the first couple of cases having my forehead, yes, your forehead. completely yes. pressed into the, <laughs> into the thing and having a mark afterwards so you're absolutely right um, this has been such an awesome conversation uh, where do folks go to get more information on ergonomics and uh, I know you do training and and coaching I think actually one of my mentors Manoj Raval in uh, in Vancouver. Oh, that's right. Yeah, and worked with you as well, and actually got you to formally do some coaching with him. and And he had us record videos of him uh, doing some cases as well. To, so, where do folks go to uh, find more information, and and how can they get in touch with you to to get some more formalized coaching? Uh, sure. Thank you. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, uh, the Society of Surgical Ergonomics easily Googled. We've tried to compile all sorts of resources, really anything and everything related to surgical ergonomics there. You can find uh, Grand Rounds type videos. You can find the videos that we used in our surgical curriculum at Iowa. Uh, we'll be putting together a whole uh, how to start a curriculum toolkit uh, that will be available. You can sign up to be members. The society is very welcoming uh, to members uh, at all levels. So particularly you mentioned our website that was designed and, and uh, is maintained by uh, one of our fabulous trainee members, Dr. Andrew Gabrielson. He's a urology resident. So uh, it, it, unlike other societies, uh, you've got something to contribute, we'll, we'll uh, put you to work, not to worry. So just reach out through, through the society uh, website. The coaching that you mentioned, that's part of my uh, personal uh, business. And um, you can also find that on my website or you can, and you can email me or uh, reach out, uh, reach me uh, through the website contact form there as well. I'd like to close by asking a question that we ask our guests. And the question is, you know, having gone through what you've gone through, if you could go back in time and give yourself advice as a, a senior resident or a chief resident, or perhaps even as an early attending, what would that advice be? Uh, I think about this now. Uh, I think I, the biggest piece of advice that I would give myself would be to um, uh, make myself, meaning a my physical health, um, uh, a priority. Um, we in healthcare are so used to giving, 
Uh, and as I mentioned, with relates, as it relates to ergonomics, you know, we put our own discomfort to the side. We accept it as part of the job. And then we don't report it either when we're having issues. Um, we, I, I'm, I'm grateful that the culture is changing and we, we care about um, physician and healthcare provider um, well-being. But that would be the biggest piece uh, of advice in retrospect that I would have given myself. I probably have a genetic predisposition to uh, herniating discs because I was very young when I herniated my first lumbar disc and my dad uh, promptly pointed out, oh, definitely you're, you're from, a, that's from our side of the family. Um, but if I had taken care of myself uh, and was in better physical shape, uh, knowing that I'm an athlete and this is, surgery is a long game, right? Um, it might have at least uh, mitigated uh, some of the injuries I had and maybe they wouldn't have been so severe. You've been listening to Cold Steel, the official podcast of the Canadian Journal of Surgery. If you like what you've heard, please leave us a review on iTunes. We love to hear your thoughts, comments, and feedback, so send us an email at podcast.cjs at gmail.com or tweet at us at CanJSurge. Thanks again.